Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to today's episode on the School of Radiance podcast. I'm your host, the Humble Human on a Mission, here to help you achieve and receive the best hair, skin, and nails of your life, slow aging, and become your most radiant version. Today we have Zora Benemu, who is a gerontologist passionate about aging and menopause. She is on a mission to disrupt menopause stigma and ageist stereotypes and is the host of the Hack My Age podcast, focusing on biohacking for women through the menopause transition. Zora is a 53-year-old digital nomad currently living in Spain. She founded the website hackmyage.com and is the author of the Longevity Master Plan and Cookbook Eating for Longevity, as well as the creator of online programs for women in peri and postmenopause. Her online presence reaches over 100,000 people. She is also the member of the Gerontological Society of America, the American Society of Aging, and the European Menopause and Andropause Society. Zora received a master's of, of gerontology at the prestigious University of Southern California. She is also a certified sports nutrition coach and oxygen advantage breathwork instructor. So you all know in today's episode, we are going to be talking about hacking menopause and supporting ourselves in the process, whether you are perimenopause, menopausal, and also postmenopausal as well. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Zora Benamu, how are you today? Thank you. I'm doing great. It's it's a real honor to be on the podcast today. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share more about what I know and about menopause and gerontology. Yes, and you and I are both digital nomads at this time. You're in Spain. I am in South Florida here. You may hear some, some garden work in the background here in the golf course as it is one of the drawbacks of of being in a place like this but it all kind of adds to the element just to set the stage so you know where we're all at so zora i would love to kick things off by putting you on the spot just a little bit i would love to hear from you what is radiance to you radiance to me is is so it could be it is so much actually but to me i would say it is that inner that inner radiance that that inner beauty that we have that just shines on the outside because you're so happy or content or in a good space on the inside and i think it doesn't really matter what you look like or what you're doing on the outside if you're not radiant on the inside and happy and content, it's it's not going to show. So I think for me, radiance is, is just being being happy on the inside. Yes, absolutely. A lot of people get this wrong or they approach skin and rejuvenation the other way around. I recommend approaching skin and rejuvenation to basically come at it to, you know, you want to feel good first and then looking good will follow. So I'm really excited to have you share your insights on your background as a gerontologist to help us all with longevity and feeling our best on the inside. But first of all, tell us a little bit about what is gerontology and why do we need to better understand it? I'm so glad you asked because a lot of people have no idea what it is. And some people can't even pronounce it, which you did very well. Thank you very much. But gerontology is the study of aging and longevity. But a gerontologist looks at it not just from a biological perspective, but from a sociological and a psychological perspective, too. So we really look at the whole life course of what's happening from birth until death. And of course, we we focus on older adults as well and advocate for older adults in, in social policy or in uh, housing and in so many other areas of life but we we do advocate for them but when we want to understand how they're aging why are they why are they getting certain diseases we do have to look at the whole life course so we do we do want to focus on 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 that so i think we yeah people should know about gerontology because the population is aging and we are going to have so many older adults with us and hopefully thriving. We don't want a sick population. We want a, a population that's able to contribute and be a part of the fabric of society. But 
so today we we have a lot of problems in in society when it comes to older adults and ageism is just one of those and the way we treat older adults is a is a reflection of actually what may happen to us if we're lucky enough to become uh 80 years old right so we want to take action now and be aware and be proactive to disrupt some of those age stereotypes Yes, absolutely. And the reason I'm familiar with gerontology is as a registered nurse, I did quite a bit of geriatric care as well as palliative nursing. And in fact, that's actually what got me into nursing was uh, first holding my grandfather's hand, Jack, while he passed away at home. We had the palliative care team come in. Mother was a registered nurse. So I was there with him during that crossing over with the family, which was just beautiful. And then a number of years later with my dear Nana Winifred as well. And I love caring for the elderly. They have so much wisdom to share for us. And unfortunately, in our society, they kind of get pushed aside. Or some of the things that I'll hear is people feel a little invisible as we age. Can you tell us psychologically why maybe that's happening and what we can do about it? Yeah, when we look at the studies that have been done across the globe in terms of how people are treating the older adults or even what they think of aging themselves, it's pretty negative. And we can see in our Western society that youth is uh, glorified <laughs> and we all try to be younger. We all want to see, we, in advertisements and media, we see always younger people. And when we do see an older adult, it's usually selling some kind of medicine. We associate negative things with the older adults and positive things with being youthful. So we don't really want to look at old age or getting older. We really try to push aside. We have a fear of death. We don't actually even expose to death very often. We put people in hospitals. We put them in nursing homes. We put them away. We shove this away. And this is a really big mistake. You can see sometimes when somebody passes away in your family or your friends, you're not even sure what to say. Do I call them? Do I text? Do they want to be bothered? We don't even really know what to do, which is which is a pity because we've lost these rituals. We're not used to seeing people dying around us. We're hiding it away. So this is a this is a problem for for us when we get to this situation. How are we going to deal with the the death? Not only for the family, but as well as how are we going to deal with it for ourselves? Because we do shove it aside, and and it, and we really want as gerontologists, we want to change that, and we want to make uh, older adults healthy. We want to keep them into the in the society, working or having being productive, contributing somehow. Because they, like you said, they do have so much to contribute. I have to say that uh, wisdom does not come with age. Unfortunately, uh, we, because we we meet a lot of older adults who just don't have those wise words of wisdom, and we can meet many younger people who do. So, in my opinion, it's experience that brings wisdom. And so, it's not that older adults don't have the experience, but to be able to be wise and share that wisdom in a way that everyone can appreciate, it it's, doesn't come automatically with age. So, we really want to try to keep those the older adults healthy and in the society so that we can uh, have this, have them not shoved away and be able to deal with certain things like diseases and death without panicking. I think it seems like today, uh, death is just, or it's not an option. Like we, we, we just, we have to go and live as long as we possibly can or, and, and, and it's a real pity because we have, I think when we look at death and able to talk about it, and digest it and accept it, that's when we start living. Yes, I grew up very traditional and Christian and actually had my mother's parents in the home throughout my whole childhood. And it truly added to a richer childhood, a strong family unit. And honestly, they were thriving. They were heavily involved with church programs and giving back and helping out. And lots of gardening as well and doing things around the home. We always had a really big garden growing up. My grandfather was quite a green thumb and a World War II veteran stormed the beaches of Normandy as a sergeant, actually, and uh, developed this really cool uh, march strategy, which makes sense because I'm such an avid hiker. It's in my genes, I suppose. 
Um, so there's so much that we can learn from our loved ones who are more mature and looking back at my career, I learned so much from my more mature clients. Here I was when I started in the industry in 2011 at age 25, and most of my clients were 50 to 90. And I just loved listening to their stories and their experience. And when you're younger, taking the time to listen from those who have wisdom to share with you is so important, but not everybody does the inner work in their lives, right? Having a strong sense of identity. So I know that that's something that you teach too, which we're going to get into. And the thing here is that what you studied gerontology and also my background with palliative nursing, death truly is the only certainty in life. And death can actually also be a beautiful time in life for crossing over when you're able and conscious to hold that space for dear loved ones to be there for them. And it, it really can bring families together and be a beautiful time depending on the framework that you enter that in, but really bringing our, our more mature loved ones into the family unit, helping them have a sense of purpose, I think is why I was able to see my grandparents thrive well into their mid 90s. So I do know I have some good genes running in my background for longevity as well. And I would just love to hear from you. Why do you think it is in life? Some individuals do the deep identity work. They become really beautiful humans. They have a lot of wisdom to share. And then others, they just kind of like stay in ruts. Maybe they're staying in programs. Maybe they have traumas that they haven't worked through. So why are some people thriving as they age and some people are failing to thrive, which is something that is used in geriatric care when an elderly person isn't thriving, failure to thrive. When I would see that in the charts, it would just break my heart. So what's creating the contrast? Well, we don't know exactly. We didn't, at least we didn't study this to, to, in our, in our program, but my opinion, I see that some older adults are have an example uh, and they've been blessed with with either a great parents or a good mentor or some other older adult who sets the example can you hear the lawnmower okay good <laughs> and so and some don't and i think when you speak to somebody right now who's in their 70s or 80s, and actually my father-in-law is a good example. He's somebody who's not thriving mentally and spiritually, and he's 86 years old and he's stuck. And when you talk to him about, hey, why don't you do some inner work or perhaps talk to just sometimes we need to offload no matter what age you are. I just want to offload stuff with a therapist. There's no way he would do that. It's a sign of weakness. It's a sign that uh, he's sick or it's just not in their generation. They don't speak about uh, mental health like we do today. At least a younger generation. There's still a stigma against it. So I think that if we can support that, make it more normal or continue with the mental health work, it will, by the time we get older, we'll be okay with it. Or, or perhaps when we're younger, already do the inner work, but it's just not part of our society and in terms of the Western world. So I think that's pretty much one of the, what I'm observing is, is one of the biggest examples. And perhaps the, have you been, you've been blessed with, with beautiful grandparents and a beautiful supportive family and and that's why you are today where you're at and it makes it so much easier but if you don't have that you have to one be aware of it and then be ready to do the work and accept that it may hurt it may be painful to do that work and it takes time so uh, I think that's one of the reasons why some of the older adults we're seeing today uh, are, are struggling those who are struggling and I think the big elements here to discuss is faith and spirituality, because I'm here to tell you that all of the thousands of clients that I've served since 2011, clinically, in person, and also online across the globe, one of the key factors to having radiance, showing up, and just having this beautiful, warm, inviting light presence is faith. And having sometimes spiritual practice, I've seen this with people with various spiritual practices, 
but this is a common theme that um, is important to take note of. And I think the reason why it can help with stress, you have something, someone to pray to and sort of like offload the things that we experience in life. And when you mentioned that seeking help and mentorship and guidance and counseling in today's society, I think that's probably started a number of decades ago that it was considered a sign of weakness. However, I would flip that script and say it's a sign of strength when you know that you do need to talk about certain things. And the thing that happens with the skin, with hair, skin, nails, and for you to under, you know this as well, when the HRV gets off, mental illness starts to happen, we start to see accelerated signs of aging. Maintaining a lower oxidative stress status is so incredibly key to allow your brain neurologically to function better. Because if you're all messed up, if you're psychologically scrambled, which, you know, there's some very sophisticated ways that that's happening to us. And you mentioned through advertisements, uh, actually uh, a little while ago, I can't recall if it was during the interview or before, but every time we see an advertisement, there's oftentimes someone who looks older and more frail. So there's a lot of programming and this is very sophisticated programming. So I want you to just kind of push those programs aside that you may have and really pay attention to some of the really beautiful nuggets that we're sharing in today's episode to support yourself and also to allow you to better relate to others. Yeah. I actually love making friends with older mm -hmm. women and made good friends with my realtor here, Joanna, here in South Florida. She's 70 and she, oh my goodness, she is so gorgeous. She carries herself in this beautiful regal way. So we don't have to be afraid of our looks as we age, you really can be a complete goddess in your 70s, 80s, and 90s. And it's a lot to do with our presence. And I just wanted to uh, check in, or if you had anything to add to that before we start to get into the nitty gritty biohacking menopause aspect. Yeah, I wanted to talk about what you just said about having faith, because we know through the research is having faith actually helps people live longer, better. And partly because, well, when you go to a church or a synagogue or your mosque, you have your community there. And we know that having social connections is very, very important. Plus you need to get out of the house and move your body and actually go somewhere. So we see older adults starting to deteriorate when they become a little sick, or maybe they have a fall and they've broken their hip and then they can't go out into society or can't go to their church and they have to sit at home and then they become depressed and then it sort of spirals out of control. So there are many reasons of having faith and, and why this is so supportive. So it, if you don't have a faith right now, find some kind of spiritual practice and, and that can have the same effect. That being said, there's been very interesting research that was done on death and dying. And what we learned is that those who have a belief, uh, a faith, a religion, they had quite a easy transition in that last period when they were dying. But they also found that those who didn't also it were those who were in the middle, who weren't quite decided, who really struggled at the at the end of their life, and their death was quite difficult and a struggle. And when I was learning this, I asked. There was a a, a colleague in a, another student in my program who actually has seen three hundred deaths. That's just she was like a death doula, and she was always there. And I asked her. She was in Montana. I said, "Is that?" is that what you're seeing? And she said, absolutely. And I just, that just blew my mind. So it's kind of like, don't sit on the fence, <laughs> choose, choose a camp, but it's always good to have community rather than being isolated. So, um, you know, whether, whether, whether that's a religion or just a spiritual practice and, and being with other human beings and having society and community and strong relationships is is very conducive to a long happy life and we I don't know if you've heard of the the Harvard study of adult development oh this is good this is a really good one um so this was a study that was done I think it was started in 1938 with by Harvard Harvard first they were Harvard students and then they followed them all throughout their life then these eventually included the, the wives and the children and offspring and it's the long one of the longest longitudinal studies done 
on the planet. And so it's amazing what they've come up with. And they looked at a lot of different factors in terms of exercise and smoking and diet. They looked at their blood pressure and they looked at their blood work. Eventually they would take MRIs and they would have all these questionnaires. And, you know, it was quite detailed every single year. They were just talking to these people. And they recently concluded that the the one single factor that had the biggest impact on having a long, healthy, happy life were strong social bonds, more than smoking, more than your diet. And that was pretty mind blowing. So it's really don't underestimate the power of your, your network, your, your connections and really work on them, which is quite a natural thing. As we age and we get closer to death, we do start to prioritize the people in our life. We do try to spend more time with the people we love who are making us feel good. Whereas when we're younger, we we just want to make as many connections as we can. We're looking for opportunities. We're looking for lots of friends and, and we start to shift as we age. So it does it is coinciding and i think people tend to do that but but some people really struggle with that and and that's a really important factor of your life that i really recommend people to nurture their network to please go and 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 talk to somebody and keep them in your lives help and and just be a part of society yes one of the deep rooted whys behind desiring clear skin healthier looking skin fuller hair you know, basically looking good is actually confidence and the deeper rooted message here, it's actually tied to survival is when you're more confident, you're going to be more confident to form your community. So doing the self-care work, both on the inside and the outside, if something's bothering you on your skin and there's options to do something about it, you do something about it, you're not going to be as self-conscious about it. And you can go out in the world with greater confidence to then cultivate your community. So sometimes people think the skin and rejuvenation stuff is very superficial, but when you approach it from the angle that I do, it's actually a very loving thing to do for yourself to also care for the largest organ of your body. So it's interesting to segue into what you mentioned about how some people transition better than others at the end of their lives. And those who are in the middle really struggle. When we look at the hero's journey, if you watch the Star Wars movie, these are perfect examples. Every single movie of this type, the Jedi are going through a hero's journey. There's a struggle and then a mentor shows up, right? So when we have mentors, so say, for example, Zora and I are mentors for you in our own rights, we can then better support you as opposed to, say, trying to go on YouTube and piecemeal all this stuff together from free content is not going to be as good. It's kind of like being a half Jedi on YouTube. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you really do need the proper master and mentor to help you. And the same thing goes with spirituality and faith-based practices. So I would put forward that those and postulate that, that those who are passing away, who are in the middle, they haven't gone through a complete hero's journey in their life and they haven't found the mentor, they haven't done the work, and they haven't received the reward. And we oftentimes go through multiple heroes journey. I just went through an enormous one (laughs) myself not too long ago. And biohacking really saved me. Uh, It really reduced stress on adrenals. And a shout out to today's sponsor, Organifi. I'm always sipping on my superfoods and adaptogenic fruit juice blends. Organifi is fantastic. They are glyphosate free. Head on over to Organifi.com forward slash Varga and save 20% on your order. Biohacking was what really allowed me to go through my hero's journey and seek the reward where I'm at now in my life without losing my hair, with my nails being stronger and longer and healthier than ever and not having my skin freak out and age on me overnight, which is what happens when we go through perimenopause and menopause because of the hormonal shifts. So biohacking is incredibly crucial for those of us going through these hero journeys, life transformations, 
and pivotal points in our lives so that we can move through them with greater sense of ease, maintain a strong identity, not get psychologically scrambled and sick in the process. So what would you suggest that women who are perimenopausal, menopausal, and postmenopausal, yes, we have about 20% male listeners as well. So this is great information for you all to hear too, so that you can support the women in your lives that are going through it. What is biohacking menopause? Well, I'm so, first of all, I commend you for doing the work in biohacking at a younger age, because I always say, longevity starts in childhood, right? So the younger you are, the more that you take care of yourself through your youth, then the better transition you'll have later on in life. And that goes for menopause. If you're able to take care of yourself, you'll have fewer symptoms. You're more likely, at least not everybody, but generally you put that, that the bar in your favor. And so taking care of yourself is really a foundation and biohacking as you would biohacking many of the things biohacking menopause we can because this is another stereotype that we have is menopause is going to be horrible everybody will have hot flashes and night sweats and moodiness and unexplained weight gain and fatigue and the list there's hundreds of symptoms of menopause so we we fear menopause like we fear aging and so but it's wrong. We don't need to fear because one, not everybody goes through all of these symptoms. Some of them have the symptoms. Some of them have strong symptoms. Some people have very mild symptoms. Some people have no symptoms at all. And what's really interesting, I've been posting these reels of menopause around the world where I will interview women from all parts of the world about their menopause experience. And those who are sharing a positive experience, kind of like, meh, I don't know, kind of uneventful for me, or I don't feel anything. The comments that we get are, some of them are are great, but some of them are very negative. Like, she's lying. That's not possible. I had a horrible experience. So I want to really change that because some people really believe that it's not possible. And unfortunately, they are suffering. And women, very often, even these women I've been interviewing around the world think that, well, suffering, you just have to, you just have to pull up your socks and, and, and you go. And it doesn't have to be that way at all. So one, we want to biohack menopause because we don't need to suffer anymore. We have solutions and it doesn't have to be only uh, hormone therapy or only medicine or whatever. If you want to go a little bit more, um, take other, you know, to avoid those things. Some people are not even candidates. There's so many things we can do. And just the basics of biohacking that you share as well, they say they do need to be modified a little bit as we get older. They are effective, just like you would see that, well, it's the same biohacking techniques that you that you use for a man may not work for a woman, or we need to modify it a little bit for according to our cycle or because we're females. And the same goes for an, an older woman as well. We, we can uh, adjust things as we go. So we can't compare all the biohacks to everybody else. And this is what biohacking means. And when I say biohacking menopause, uh, we are finding those little those little hacks in order to stop the the hot flashes from happening or be able to uh, build more muscle. I hate weight loss or I hate that word weight loss. I just want to change the 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 language with that because if you focus on losing weight or burning fat, we we are not focused on staying strong and being agile and having power. And it's 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 not just about looking good in a bikini. We want to be able to carry our groceries up the stairs. And we may not think about that when we're younger because we can't imagine we'll get there, Uh, but you will if you're lucky and you want to hack it as early as possible is so that you don't have to suffer from joint pain or or sarcopenia, which is that age-related muscle mass loss. There's, There's things we can do. And it's really the foundation of biohacking in my world is having a getting your sleep and stress managed, uh, having the community and knowing yourself, uh, having purpose in life, and then you're getting the, the proper nutrition that's appropriate for you and and uh, the, the bright exercise and 
this is really foundation. And then there's those hacks and the, the middle part of a pyramid. I'm saying like the next level would be say your supplements or, um, or having some peptides or whatever kind of treatments that you don't need a doctor for. And then the very top tier of biohacking is the things that you would maybe need a doctor for, which would maybe be hormone therapy or PRP injections or stem cell therapy and, you know, all of that stuff. But really if we get a good foundation, the, that, that uh, increases our chances that maybe we don't need that middle and the top, top tier. So, so this is what I, I do is try to teach women going through that, how to use some of our biohacking tools in order to stop whatever symptom it is that they're experiencing. Fantastic. I would love your thoughts on tips for reducing the sphere and things like negative thought forms um, this is where faith and spirituality really comes into play, as well as psychologically understanding that these negative thought forms are not from our own. And they can actually be from external forces, as well as through programs. So I'd love for you to share what your most vibrant clients are doing to reduce this fear response, because fear stresses you out. It's going to age you at a faster rate. If you're scared of something, you're probably going to just even continue to perpetuate and bring it into your consciousness. So what are some of the biohacks around that psychologically? Well, one of the responses to fear is the breathing uh, rate and the types of breathing that people have. When we're feared, when we have fear, we our heart rate goes up. We start to to breathe much faster, and this is really not good for for aging. So I, I always like to work on that because we can control our breathing. And I I, I studied with Patrick McEwen with the oxygen advantage in terms of functional breathing. How do we just breathe every single day? And it is amazing what happens to the body physiologically when we're able to control our breath. And because when it's out of control, the fear gets out of control too. But if we can control our breath, we start to feel more calm and a little bit less afraid. So I, I just didn't want to forget to talk about breathing. So please learn how to breathe. Uh, in terms of the fear, sometimes we, we have these fears because we are exposed to negative stereotypes. We may see uh, people who are frail in the media, or maybe you have uh, grandparents who were very, very sick and you think, or parents who were sick and you feel this is your destiny and it looks horrible. So you've been exposed to so many negative things that you start to build this fear. So the, the idea is to reverse that. Let's go look for some positive uh, stereo stereotypes, positive of uh, people, people who are aging well, getting inspired by those adults who are doing something with their lives, who are positive, who are happy, who are fit, who are who are uh, taking care of themselves. And and it was interesting because when I was studying gerontology, uh, I asked some of the other students. I, I mean, they were some some of them were many, many of them were actually very young they were in their 20s and uh early 30s and i said why are, i mean i know why i'm studying this <laughs> i'm kind of getting there but why are you studying this and they said oh because i had such lovely grandparents and they were amazing and i i wanted to be able to help more i want to do something or my mother used to work in a nursing home and and i had such a good time when she dragged me with her and they they saw some really positive examples of becoming older. And so they have no fear. So I would love for people to expose themselves to positive uh, older adults who are who are inspiring. And, and what we learned as well is I try to share as much as I can on, on, on my social media when I find some, some older adults, whether it's my personal content or sharing someone else's who are, you know, I'll doing marathons in their nineties or, um, gymnastics in their eighties and, and, or somebody looks super fit in, in their seventies. And, and, and it is, I find it inspiring. However, the, the WHO, the world health organization says in order to combat ageism, we do have to also provide realistic examples because that could backfire. Those people who are far from 
running a marathon or looking as as if they were much younger is actually going to have a negative effect on them because they will just say, you know what, it's not realistic. I'm not even going to try. So we do need to include all different types of people. And, and this is why when I share menopause around the world, I'm not on an agenda to say, hey, you know, everyone's having a fabulous time with menopause. I'm just letting people speak whatever it is that they want, just to show that there are there are many choices, many things that can happen during menopause. And when we age, uh, yes, there are people who are aging poorly and who are sick and, and who don't take care of themselves. And that's just one choice on the menu of aging. We have uh, many other things on the menu that we can choose from. So in order to stop the fear, we need to look at positive examples and to, to know that there's hope or it's not all doom and gloom. And when you look at it that way, it is much, it is much easier. And, and perhaps also like we spoke about before is to, is to embrace death, to be under, to understand what that process is, what to, to face it, to be comfortable with it. It's not, it's a taboo topic. So we need to disrupt that as well. So I think once you understand that the, the fear goes away when you are able to deal with that. And, and then you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to age whatever way you want. I don't care how people age. I just want them really to be happy <laughs> and whatever that may be. And there's no, there's no, uh, we should all take do Botox or we should, you know, get rid of our wrinkles and dye our hair. Like it really doesn't matter. As long as you're happy, that's, that's where, that's where I I'm at right now. So I really love to to have people just really decide how they're going to age and, and embrace it and, and be okay with it, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things you brought up was the, you know, physical things that we can do to improve our looks because, you know, women and men have this fear of, Oh, what about those grays? Well, you know what? There's some biohacking for that, uh, including things like spermidine, that have, you know, I've seen some incredible before and after photos or some rejuvenation options for that. Reducing oxidative stress is super key for that. When we look at people who experience different things in lives, and I would postulate that this is an approach to view menopause and life transitions, you have this bell curve. So some people are going to be experiencing, you know, the most common symptoms of menopause or stress during, you know, you're going through your own hero's journey, right? And going through your transition in your life, which is added stress, by the way, stress is a sign that you're alive. So you can also look at it that way, not fear it, but say, hey, there's something for me to overcome here. What can I learn in the process? How can I better myself so that next time a stressful event comes up, I'll be even more confident to overcome it than ever. Dyeing the hair. I actually love it when my more mature clients actually embrace the grays and start to go a little bit lighter, more blonde, instead of doing the dark hair dye. We've all seen the 70, 80, 90 year old men and women. I mean, who are you fooling? You're not a dark <laughs> auburn brown. We all know this, but one of the funny things that happens here with our vision is, you know, we experience cataracts, right? And this is a, an ocular disease of the lens of the eye. And this is often a procedure that needs to be done for people in their eighties. Here's why biohacking is so important for helping you be healthier and happier as you age one of my girlfriends, she's 45. She needs cataract surgery. Oh, wow. That's early. This is an 80 year old disease. And we're starting to see disease is actually in a younger population. Why? Environmental toxins and oxidative stress. How does biohacking help? Wearing those blue light blocking glasses, reducing your exposure to electromagnetic frequencies, reducing your stress. These are also key in maintaining happy, healthy, balanced hormones. And I love that you didn't ju just jump straight to hormone replacement therapy. I have a certain experience with this. My mother having been on HRT and developed estrogen receptive breast cancer. And then I hear other people that again, had a great experience with it. Everyone's different. Again, everyone is at a certain position in that bell curve of experiencing more symptoms, less symptoms, and all of the symptoms. So what we want to do is to be more conscious and place ourselves in that bracket where we're simply going to move through life 
with more grace and ease and having the tools to help us along in that process, which may not be traditional tools. I never learned about any of this stuff in my eight years of post-secondary education, bachelor's of science, as well as gen chem, organic chem and biochem. I really only learned about this afterwards, like with you listening to so many people and having interviewed well over 400 experts in the field, and then being on probably about 400 other experts in researching this stuff. There's so much that we can learn through conversation and community and connection with each other. Just depends how receptive you are to then actually act and employ these things and not try. Stop being a trier. Notice people who use the word try. I love to study linguistics and teach this in the School of Radiance membership so that we're more conscious with the way that we're living and more conscious with those we're making connections with and deciphering what level they're on and whether or not we want to have deep relationships with them personally or professionally, depending on how psychologically scrambled they are as well. There's some really deep stuff here. So when it comes to biohacking at menopause, I would suggest that if you're getting those hot sweats, uh, night flash, night, night sweats and hot flashes rather, that using temperature regulating technology on your bed is super key. I have a couple of pieces of tech that I love um, that you can find on my favorites page for biohacking at the school of radiance.com. But I would love to hear your suggestions as well for say a PM routine to set someone up for success if they are dealing with menopausal issues. Well, it, get, it depends on what it is that they're feeling. So we can talk about hot flashes because that's one of the most common symptoms of menopause. And like you said, a chili pad or a, a cooling mat or cooling pillow really helps in the night, keeping your bedroom cool at night as well. In about, I don't know, we, I would say 16 degrees here in Europe and then in the US, probably around 60, a little bit less. And I think about 63 to 69 is a sweet spot. I sleep at 67. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's a, there's a range, but you just want to get, you want to be able to feel like a little chilly and that you jump into your bed and then you actually can pull up the covers and, and feel good. So keep that bedroom cool. The only problem is, is that if you're sleeping with somebody who is not having hot flashes and is freezing all the time, then you have to adjust. And so you can either, that's why this, this, this cooling mat is really good because you only put it on one side of the bed. The other thing I did hack, I discovered just recently when I was in Poland is when people, they prepare a bed and I'd say a queen size or a king size bed, they actually put two comforters on there. And so if you're one of these people who are like a Torero, you know, it's like sheet on, sheet off, sheet on, sheet off. And your partner there is going, what is going on, this is a great hack. So you can actually take it off when you want, put it on when you want without disturbing the person next door. But uh, uh, across the across the board, the hormone therapy has been shown to be the most effective with hot flashes. It will reduce them uh, or get rid of them completely quite quickly. But again, it's not for everyone. And this is why it is a fabulous hack, but it's one of those things you really need the guidance from a qualified doctor, because only 7% of the doctors in the US feel that they're capable and confident of guiding a woman through menopause. So there are very few out there, but you could go to uh, the North American Menopause Society website. You could find doctors who are trained in that, ask around with your friends. I, I would be, I would go with somebody who can actually not just, there are doctors out there who just kind of standard prescribe estrogen and progesterone uh, or just estrogen, or, you know, they're not, they're, it's a standard uh, formula. And I don't think that's correct. I think everyone is bio-individual. We all, we need to dig, dig a little bit deeper. I like to recommend to my clients to take the Dutch test. This is the dried urine test of comprehensive hormones. No matter what age you are, it's a great test. It's expensive, but I consider it an investment in understanding your hormones because we can see that we have three major types of estrogen, E1, E2, E3, and we can see how they're metabolizing through this test. And we can see that they're going down a pro-cancerous pathway or a safe healthy pathway. And most doctors don't know what this is. If you did the test, you gave it to them, they wouldn't know what to do with it. But I really encourage people to take responsibility of their health, learn about it, 
uh, understand it, go find a doctor who does know what they're doing and how to interpret it. Uh, and then be able to, if you decide you want to take hormone therapy, then, okay, you can test, assess, and reassess and measure and all of this because you don't want to go just willy-nilly taking whatever, hoping, okay, when well, the hot flashes are gone, but you're putting yourself at risk for something else, really get the right formula, get the right dosage, get the right uh, there's so many, there's, there's uh, oral and there's creams and there's gels and there's sprays and there's just so much out there, but really you want to learn. This is what we, we teach in our biohacking menopause programs is what's out there, how to decide what's the difference between compounded and, and uh, the pharmacy, what you get in the pharmacy. There's, there's, it's a whole world out there. And unfortunately most women don't know about it. It's kind of like reverse puberty. When we were going to have our periods, we, nobody really educated us unless you were lucky to have a mother who did, except you talk to your girlfriends, like what's going to happen. I know I'm going to bleed, but that's kind of about it. Or you and, read cosmopolitan magazine in your teens. Yes. <laughs> yes. Cause that was all you could get. Now there's so much out there, but this we're kind of in the same place. If you're in your four, late forties or going through perimenopause, most women don't even know what's going on. They they think menopause is oh in their fifties, so I'm like ten years away from that. But no, the reality is is the average age of menopause is fifty one, and perimenopause that time around menopause, when your hormones start to fluctuate and then start to deplete, uh, that will be around age 46. So if you're in your forties, you really need to be aware that you're not going crazy. Your doctors may want to prescribe antidepressants or something. If you're struggling with mood swings, it's not that go test your hormones, go find out where you're at, because it could be that you are in, in perimenopause and just being aware of that and knowing it will help so much. So that's sort of my hormone therapy. Uh, and I'm talking about bioidentical hormones because they're synthetic and then there's bioidentical, which we, we need to understand as well. It's mimics your own hormones. So uh, that's for hot flashes, quite, quite effective, but there's also a new, a new uh, drug that just got uh, out into the market. The FDA approved it. I think it was in in uh, May, uh, Vioza, V-E-O-Z-A-H, and it works on receptors in the brain that control temperature. So that's been shown to reduce hot flashes. It's kind of a new thing. Uh, I haven't experimented with it with any of my clients yet, but it's something to investigate. If you're like, I don't want to do hormones, well, we do have drugs. There are antidepressants that that also work, uh, but in the working with a doctor obviously knows any of the side effects. It's nothing wrong and you shouldn't be ashamed if you do need to take that, but not necessarily, it's not necessarily for the, the depression. You may not have depression at all, but they're quite effective for hot flashes. So there are many things. And then there's adaptogens. There's a lot of supplements out there. Uh, there's maca that, that helps as well. And then there's, um, there's rhodiola. There's things that, that you can actually not only great for hot flashes, but may give you more energy and combat a lot of other things, but, but we don't have enough scientific evidence that this works great for everybody like you would in hormone therapy. But I always say people just to try it, you never know. And maybe you figure out a formula of adaptogens and supplements that, that work for your hot flashes. Uh, and, and it's, it's worth a try. It's certainly, um, there's, there's very low risk to, to it at all. And I, in my program, I have a cheat sheet kind of which ones and how much to take and dosages and things like that. Don't just go to the pharmacy and take whatever, just consult with somebody who kind of knows what they're doing, because it depends if you have thyroid issues, then you may need to be careful with maca and, uh, or, or other issues that you may have. So please just, uh, make sure you talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. And it can recommend also a high quality supplement as well, because I think you and I know both that, uh, most of the supplements that are out there on the shelves are, are not containing what they say they have in the bottle, or they have very small dosages and that are not effective. Or people are getting them off Amazon or eBay. And yes, I heard you huge, say that today. Huge problem. Anything you're putting on or in your body, do not get from these websites because they're probably a knockoff, right? Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned Rodolia, Amlobacopa, and all these other adaptogens, Organifi has them in there. And then mm. the other thing that I would just say, I take a very conservative approach to any type of new drug, especially when it comes to 
new rejuvenation injectables. I've always had this position of, and I just learned this early on in my career with um, these types of dermal fillers that were applied that were biostimulatory. And then 10, 15 years down the line, there's class action lawsuit because people are having inflamed nodules and their faces are scarred. And I've, I've seen this happen. And so I always like to just pause and wait for things to be on the market for a number of years to gather more clinical evidence because there's always new bright, shiny objects coming out. And one of the things I'd love to jump back on is the fact to start with the basics when it comes to biohacking. And I just wrote a paper on this oxidative stress status and its impacts on the skin. You can read it over on my website, theschoolofradiance.com and go to the research tab. And I really highlight the keys to start to do now in regards to biohacking with purifying your air, water, lighting, electromagnetics, and regular detoxing. Not to mention, and Zora, we're doing a consultation together. I'm very excited to ensure that you're using products that aren't precipitating hormone imbalances. And this happens all the time. I get on a consultation with a new one-on-one -on -one client, which you can book using promo code podcast 15 over at the school of radiance.com. I look forward to connecting with you and providing customized skin information for you with the plan and what to do at home, what to do at clinic with ongoing support. And this happens all the time. A client says, you know, I have hormonal issues, thyroid issues. And then I look at the products that they're using and they're using known hormone disruptors, parabens, phthalates, sulfates, artificial dyes, fragrances, artificial fragrances contain phthalates. And what happens when you're spraying your perfume, you're putting it right on your thyroid. So there's all these products that are, that are marketed for beautification and big beauty, but they're actually then owned by big pharma or big food, believe it or not. And they're actually really contributing to oxidative stress in the body. So that's why you want to take all these, you know, influencers that you see online on YouTube, talking about this product and that product for skin stuff. A lot of times products that are recommended uh, by health practitioners on YouTube are simply recommending easy to purchase inexpensive products. And they don't have an awareness of the importance of clean ingredients while also meeting performance. So I just wanted to put that out there. Key things for menopause. Um, there is actually a product that I sell on my e-store. It's called Estrovera. It's made by Metagenics. It's third-party independent lab tested. They do actually have research studies showing that it does help with cough lashes. So there are ah, some free options. Oh, we have to there. share that one. Yeah. Yeah, oh it's my on my ASTAR. And it's backed by third-party independent lab-tested research, which is what I go for all the time. I'm really particular what products and supplements that I suggest. Because as you know, Zora, there's lots of influencers out here that are making their own brands. They're working with not great formulations, really subpar labs, which you as the consumer might not know about. The temperature regulating mattress cover, love the eight sleep. You'll find that on my biohacking page as well. That one is just incredible. It optimizes your sleep stage for you and your partner, your sleep temperature, depending on your sleep stage. It also tracks your HRV, but I'm telling you that taking a drug to adjust the brain for temperature regulation is probably working on the hypothalamus uh, with kids. That's why when they're outside and they don't register cold and you have to tell them to put a coat on is because their hypothalamus isn't properly um, developed yet. And so I always want to go to the root cause. What's the root cause? And there are excellent peptides on the market as well that support central nervous system function. Um, melanotan is one of them that works on a number of different pathways, which is really cool. So that's kind of fringe in the biohacking space using peptides. Big barrier there is they're injected. And sometimes people don't want to be injecting themselves, kind of like um, uh, insulin at home with the diabetic. But the temperature regulation is so key. The stress component is so key. And so when you feel fear creep in and those negative thought forms, you literally need to banish them and start to turn down that knob on the reptilian brain. And just know that you're doing the best. You're here on the podcast, you're absorbing excellent information. You are meeting mentors like myself and Zora to help you along your journey as well. I like that you mentioned um, the, oh gosh, I'm just having a, a brain fog moment, um, that we can 
use the um, the peptides. That's interesting space that I haven't haven't gone into. And um, gosh, I totally totally wanted to <laughs> bring something up, and I forgot what I was going to say, but it'll come back to me because it just triggered something that that I think a lot of women uh, can do in terms of if you don't want to do hormones, and of course, drugs would be the last resort, uh, if you, if you can, because there are so many things. Yeah. Women, women can notice if they eat something hot or spicy, like a coffee or something, some spicy food that can trigger. But I notice a lot of women in my program, when I go through that, speak with them, they would, I ask them to track, to be a biohacker, track everything you can possibly do in these four weeks. And, 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 and I know it's a pain in the butt, but, but do it because you will start to find trends. So every time a hot flash comes journal, what's happening in your day. If you had an argument, if it's been stressful, rate yourself on a scale of zero to, to 10 on how much stress you had. And they do find patterns. The days that they are more stressed, they will have more or more intense hot flashes. So like you mentioned, stress is a really big uh, trigger for, for those hot flashes and night sweats. And, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I, another thing is to, uh, if you have, at least the, the research has shown, excess body fat, then you are more at risk of getting hot flashes. Not that everyone who's overweight has hot flashes and those who are underweight or normal weight, they also do have hot flashes, but there is a correlation there. So if you can, uh, and, and fat is a thermal regulator and we'd like to pack it in and keep us warm. So try to, if you are uh, have excess body fat and we do need some body fat, I'm not saying we should be skinny. I'm just saying that if you have that extra body fat, you can try to manage the weight a little bit, and then you may have fewer hot flashes. Yeah. And I think that that's excellent. And that's one of the things I really love to teach is to become your own intuitive investigator of yourself. And the cool thing about the skin, because it's the largest organ, it tells us so much. So say, for example, you're experiencing skin redness or skin redness around more stressful times or more breakouts or hyperpigmentation, accelerated aging, look at, again, what those things are. And oftentimes it is stress. And we're, if you're not outside enough, you're not grounding, you're not barefoot outside, getting those electron exchanges. So when we're inside, we become more positive. We get an overaccumulation of protons. And then when we go outside, we ground and the earth gives us more negative ions. And if that's off, your neural pathways are going to be off. You're going to be feeling more jittery. Um, same thing goes with blood sugar regulation. That's really key. That can impact the mood too. So you also want to look at fasting um, in a way that really feels good for you and doesn't make you feel jittery and off and things like that. Exercise is really key. So whether it's 30 to 60 minutes a day doing something to move the body, it's really great. You're going to get those endorphin rushes. Prayer is so incredibly key. When stress comes up, get quiet, meditate and pray. Big it to the give it to the big guy. That's what he's there for, right? You know, we're more powerful than we're than we are led to believe. Uh, we're we're more psychic and intuitive than we are led to believe. So taking those quiet moments to rest, which is contradictory to women working like a man, which, you know, is going to be a huge contributing factor. Women are more soft. We're more graceful. We are more beautiful. We can't function at the same rate as a man because we have these cycles and transitions in our lives. So for the guys listening, it's just good for you to know, no, your wife or your partner is not going nuts. They're just going through it. And to have the emotional intelligence to support them is really key. And it's really great when the masculine man shows up for the feminine woman when they're going through that and can be supportive. And it is possible. The thing about excess body fat is that the fat cells itself hold on to toxins. That's where a lot of toxins in our body are stored. So there are some rejuvenation options available that can either shrink or completely destroy fat cells which is very interesting. And you're going to go through some detoxing stuff with that. But having a healthy body fat, having a little extra can actually be really good. I see this a lot in the biohacking space, people actually looking really frail and actually too thin in regards to what a quote unquote healthy BMI is. And um, a healthy weight is going to be specific to you. 
However, if you're reducing the oxidative stress, you are exercising with the combination of cardiovascular training, strength and, and conditioning and flexibility and mobility. Those are three key things to touch on. And the other thing with weight gain is emotional baggage. When you actually see someone who's overweight, there are typically deep rooted emotional reasons why someone is overweight and traumas that they've gone through. And in the hero's journey, they maybe didn't find a mentor to help them out and weren't really doing the work to make a change. Um, but it is tough these days with the weight gain, just with the toxicity of our foods, with the toxic seed oils that are in just about everything. Like one of the concerns a lot of my clients have is they don't want to eat out because to be social because they don't want to get exposure to things. So making your own food as much as possible is really, really key. Invite them over for dinner. Yes, <laughs> make right? your own food. Absolutely. Yeah. Look for your family as much as possible. You'll save money. Everyone will feel better. But the other thing I wanted to briefly mention, Zora, about the skin and skin redness and hot flashes is a lot of times in clients that I work with, they're toxic and they're eating a lot of histamines in their food. So reduce the over 24 hour leftovers because the, that's going to be releasing histamines. Love what you said earlier about doing the Dutch test. Test instead of gas, eat the right foods for you. Get the biome test. That's on my biohacking page as well. And the more pure you become, the emptier toxic bucket is, the more intuitive and in tune you will be. So love the idea of tracking Zora, uh, either with the eight sleep or in sleeping with EMF blankets and clothing on. It's really key because it's going to kick off EMFs and Bluetooth. But also with the aura ring that I see you have, always, always, always make sure that that thing is on airplane mode. So, so key. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned exercise. I mean, we kind of segue into that unexplained weight gain. And that is such a magic bullet for women in menopause. And I it it will lower the symptoms of our uh, uh, menopause experience, but also it you're going to not only just lose the body fat or or have enough of it and get manage your your weight, but you may also have fewer hot flashes. And it is going to control our blood sugar response, right? Because we become more insulin resistant as we get through peri and post menopause. But that means we just can't eat the same way that we used to. And we have to change. And what I was finding with a lot of women I was coaching uh, in their 40s is that they were exercising like crazy and eating practically nothing. And they were just the more they exercised, the, the, the bigger they got. And that was really frustrating. So you mentioned too, is, is exercise is good, but what does that mean for a woman going through menopause? And that means very much like what you said, you get enough of your your cortisol rise through say a hit workout or something, but not this chronic cardio anymore that we used to think was just burn all the fat. We also want to make sure we have time for yoga or walking in nature, uh, forest bathing, bring down that cortisol so that we can, because uh, cortisol loves to hold on to body fat, right? Especially around the belly. So we want to make sure we, we include a wide range of activities, plus the strength training, which you mentioned as well, this is going to build muscle, right? And the more muscle you have, the faster your metabolism runs and you're focused on strength and power. And there's so many other benefits to it. So, so don't worry if you just, you see all these transitions, we have so many hacks. I think you, you and I both dropped some golden, golden nuggets here. There's so much to choose from. It depends on the time and where you're at. Can you acquire some of these things? Can you fit it into your schedule, but just do it. You will see that you will have such an ex amazing experience through menopause. And many of the women I, I interviewed through the, in the menopause around the world reels, they, they often describe, I, I ask them, describe menopause in one word. And, and many of them will say rebirth, transition, transformation, uh, opportunity, and these positive words, which I'm amazed because once you don't really see it when you're in the middle of it, but once you're on the other side, 
they have a different perspective and it is. And if we can just think of it as positive and, and not be afraid of it, just like you're not afraid of aging, you're just not afraid of menopause, your experience will be so much better. There's, there's research by Becca Levy. She's a gerontologist who studied aging around the world. And, and she looked at, at many people and asked about their attitudes towards aging. And those who had a positive mindset who were, okay, you know, it's a transition or rebirth or whatever it is, all about about a very positive experience, uh, they lived seven and a half years longer than those who had a negative uh, thought patterns about aging. And the same goes for menopause. We have research showing that if those who have supportive communities, who have positive attitudes towards menopause, have fewer symptoms. So the the power of the mind what we put in our head what we what we're feeding our brain is very very impactful to our experience in life and to our experience in menopause yes absolutely and um staying positive being in positive emotional states being in the feminine balanced feminine reducing toxins limiting emotional stressors, things that are constantly keeping you in a stress state, that excess weight will fall off. And I'll be the first to tell you, when I left a moldy home, a relationship that was no longer serving me, that was keeping me out of the feminine way too much in the masculine, when I left, it just melted off. I could hardly believe it. And then I did a, a five-day fast in Sedona and Southern Utah as well at Elevation. Uh, but I still ate foods. I was hiking and things like that. It was just transformative to my body. So if your body is giving you these niggles to make these changes, listen to them and, and don't put them by the wayside because they could very well transform your life. And maybe you just needed to hear that. Zora, mm -hmm. do you have any closing words for us today? Well, my message is to women in, in peri and, and post-menopause, women who's in their 40s, 50s, 60s is, is, menopause is inevitable. If you're lucky, you're going to go through it, but we don't have to suffer. There are many options out there. Don't fear it. R read up, educate yourself. There's now so much information out there. There are books, there are websites, there are menopause societies that have meetings. There's so much out there. Don't just go to your doctor blindfolded and say, okay, I'm having menopause. What do I do about it? Uh, or I think I'm in menopause. Do your research and check out the Hack My Age website. I've got a lot of resources there. And everything that you're doing, Rachel, is, is biohacking menopause, right? Everything you do is, and that's going to set you up. So I appreciate all the work that you do and, and setting women up for a really, really positive menopause transition. Thank you so much for your kind words, Zora. And for all of you listening, be sure to go to hackmyage.com. Check out the link in the description of this episode in the show notes. And be sure to use promo code Rachel Varga when you sign up to work with Zora at hackmyage.com. I've loved connecting with you and love the work that you're doing, the research, your approach. And I think that this, I don't think, I know that this is very valuable information for men and women to really have at any age because the men can benefit from this stuff too, right? It's, you know, we might have different bodily systems, but at the end of the day, biohacking and supporting slowing aging process through reduction of oxidative stress status and toxins, especially in the air, water, lighting, electromagnetics. And there's some great strategies to do that. Uh, Zora, you're just a wealth of information, and I'm confident that everyone who tuned in today on the School of Radiance podcast is definitely going to be checking out your podcast as well. Tell everyone where they can find you and how you can support them. Everything is on the hackmyage.com website. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube, always hack my age. Keep it simple. And if you can't remember hack my age, just Google Zora the Explorer. That's my other name. And you always find everything, everything there. So I'm I'm so grateful, Rachel, for, for allowing me the opportunity to share this information. My absolute pleasure. And for those of you who are looking for additional skin guidance, that one-on-one -on -one session, 
skin camp, seasonal skin camps for expert tutorials and the School of Radiance membership for that a cherry on top for a presentation, the deeper aspects of beauty and radiance. That's what the membership's all about. Head on over to the schoolofradiance.com to learn more. If you have questions, send me an email. There's also a link for an introductory call for us to get to know each other. Then I can share the different strategies that can support you. Also, be sure to check out the Always Radiant Skin Shop, where you can shop over 250 products, skincare, hair care, personal care products, hair, skin, nail supplements, all pre-vetted by me. Shop easy, knowing they're free of the toxins that we need to avoid. Thank you so much, Zora. Benamu for joining us here on the School of Radiance podcast. I do look forward to having you back on and everybody have a radiant day.